Good morning. Good to see everybody. Glad you're here. Thanks for being here. Uh, my name is Stephen. If you're new, and uh, I'm the pastor here, and it's uh, good for you or good for good to see you. I'll say that. We're in the near end of a series called Jesus the King, and uh, we started this series back at the beginning of June. We're studying the Gospel of Mark. And uh, we've made our way almost entirely through it. We have this week and next week, and then we are uh, done with this series. And uh, we're in this season right now. We're in the, uh, the portion of Scripture uh, that is pretty heavy. In fact, what we've just seen last week was uh, Jesus, his last supper, the institution of communion. Uh, we skipped over a little section of Jesus predicting Peter's denial. And now we're into what is a very famous scene of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. When I was a freshman in college, uh, I had uh, on, brought with me to my dorm room a life-size poster cutout uh, that I had received for my 18th birthday. It was of a, of a uh, political figure. I won't tell you which one. Uh, it was George Bush. And we went, uh, my friends and I, while we were uh, in our first year of college, would do something very fun with this cutout. So we had maids who cleaned our bathrooms for us. I know, tough life. And what we would do is we would hide the cutout in the showers all across the hallway. And then at moments, you would hear the maids just scream out in terror because they'd open the shower and there would be George Bush staring at them, right? Now, um, it was fun, and it was fun when you got to actually hear them scream, and uh, sometimes they would get back at us and put it somewhere else or, like, hide it in our doorway or something like that, and so we had fun with this all through the school year, and uh, there is uh, something, uh, there's nothing quite like a sudden shock that strikes you. Uh, just this last week, I was um, surfing some news site I can't remember, and this article popped up, and it said, a local woman killed an African safari. Not that scary of a headline, but at the time, my mom was on an African safari. It wasn't her, uh, thankfully. I know this is tragic for somebody, but uh, that story popped up on the news, and my heart just did something that I couldn't control, right? So I read through the story. And uh, there are these moments like that where you can't control how you respond. It just hits you, and your body has these natural responses to it. Jesus, we are going to see a, a striking response to something this morning. And uh, it has been said by many and pointed out by many that if we compare Jesus' moment prior to death in the garden, it pales what would appear in courage to many other people. In fact, uh, just a couple of chapters later in the Bible, there's this guy named Stephen who gets martyred for his faith in Jesus, and he goes out singing. Even Mel Gibson went out better. I mean, he just screamed freedom and died in Braveheart. We see these stories of heroes, and they go out with bravery, not falling to their knees. So why is it? that Jesus didn't die quite so well. You would look at the story and you would think he's not as heroic as even those Christians who came after him if, if he had been facing the same thing. So we're going to see this morning what was it that Jesus faced that made him respond. And remember, he was fully human. We're going to see his humanity in this story. What made him respond the way he did? Again, if we had a title to this sermon, I would call it The Strength of Sorrow. The Strength of Sorrow. And so here we see Jesus. It says, they went to a place, they being the disciples, called Gethsemane. Now, Jesus had been to Gethsemane before. Uh, he had been there probably with his disciples before. It was a familiar place with them. And so they go to this place, and Jesus knows what's about to happen to him. And he says to his disciples, sit here while I pray. Here's the first thing we have to see in this text. Jesus knows what he is walking into. 
He knows that he's about to walk into something very, very trauma-filled. He knows uh, that the next moments of his life are not going to be joyous or fun. And he teaches us something, to go in and to pray in those moments. Keller, in his book, Tim Keller, in his book, Jesus the King, points out that uh, throughout history, there are different philosophical thoughts, as well as just as humans, we know we often do many different things in the face of suffering. Sometimes we just want to be distracted. And so we're in suffering, and so we go do something else. We go play golf, or we put on a movie, or we do whatever we can. And it's not always bad to distract ourselves in the moments of sorrow. Another thing we could do is we could detach ourselves Just try to get out of the situation and not think about it and be completely detached from reality. Another response to sorrow. Jesus does something else. He goes into prayer in the midst of sorrow. And it's like he's getting deeper into the sorrow. One thing we should take away from this text is that in the midst of sorrow, in the midst of overwhelming grief, We should be driven to prayer. We should be driven to commune with our Father like he was. Now it says in this text, he took with him Peter, James, and John. Now these three characters are oftentimes isolated with Jesus. In fact, uh, the writer Mark actually tells another very significant story of when Peter, James, John, and Jesus were all together. Uh, It's in the Gospel of Mark. We didn't study it due to time. I think it's in chapter 8. And you could argue that the other time that Peter, James, John, and Jesus were alone was Jesus' greatest moment of uh, divine or human victory. His greatest moment of divinity in his humanity. So what happened is Jesus, Peter, James, and John went on top of a mountain. And on there, this is called Jesus' transfiguration. It's almost like he took on his heavenly form while he was still on earth. And Moses and Elijah show up. It's crazy. You can read it on your own. And Peter, James, and John are there with them on the mountain. Now, that uh, moment right there has even become vernacular in uh, Christian language, like a mountaintop experience, like experiencing God's presence in a way unlike you ever have before because God manifested his presence on that mountain through Jesus in a way he never had or hasn't since in that moment. And he's with Peter, James, and John. And so in his moment of greatest victory, Jesus brings some friends with him. And in his moment of greatest sorrow, Jesus brings the same friends with him. And there's a couple other similarities. Now, one thing I think Jesus is teaching us is this, that unfortunately, some friends who will be with you in victory won't be with you in sorrow. They'll go with you to the mountain, but not to the garden. But there is something encouraging in this, and that is this, that Jesus knows both. That Jesus knows both the mountain and the garden. That Jesus knows both the victory and the sorrow. We've been talking all series about Jesus as king. In this story, one of the things we learn is Jesus as friend. In fact, if that's not a relationship that you have with Christ, you're actually missing out on the entirety of relationship with Jesus. Jesus as friend. Jesus, as I am in this most difficult moment, and you're going to see here in a moment, Jesus wanted human companionship with him in his darkest moment. He just wanted a friend. And so he said, come with me. And Jesus is with us in those moments as friend because he knows what it's uh, to be in sorrow and for your friend to not be there with you. And so he always is. Now he brings them, the friends with them. He took with them Peter and James and John, and he began to be greatly distressed and troubled. Let me go on. It says, he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. That phrase, remain here and watch, is actually somewhat militant. Remain here and observe. Remain here and fight with me. In other words, friends, will you stand with me right now when I need it most? 
Now, back to the other story. When Peter, James, and John, and Jesus went up on the mountain and they had this great moment, they had to leave the mountain eventually, and they came back off the mountain. And when they got off the mountain, the rest of the disciples were surrounded by this group, and they're trying to cast out an evil spirit inside of someone, and they're unable to do it, the rest of the disciples. And Jesus and these three show up on the scene, and Jesus says something to them. You know what it is? Oh, you, you don't understand prayer. That's why you're not able to do this. I'm just pointing out the similarities here. See, in the mountain, Jesus comes off of it with these three, and the issue he sees in the church or in the other disciples is that they're not fully comprehending or understanding prayer. And now we're going to see Jesus in his, in his moment of sorrow, and he's going to go back to those disciples. James and John, and he's going to say something to them. You know what it is? Oh, you don't know how to pray. Jesus is trying to teach us something. I think he's teaching us this. In the moment of victory and in the moment of sorrow, we need to know how to pray. So he says to them, I'm rereading this. My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch, or remain here and fight. Remain here and pray with me. Then he goes on a little further, and he falls on the ground. By the way, Jesus had just spent, uh, the story before this, he had just spent communal time or corporate time in prayer. Something else this teaches us is this. Um, corporate prayer is not an excuse or a replacement of personal prayer. Like, you, you don't say, I went to church, and so I'm good. It is great that you come to church. I'm really glad that you show up. But our relationship, though it is corporal and communal, it is also individual. And if Jesus needed more than just corporate prayer, so do you and I. He needed this time in the garden. And so do you. So do you. I would say daily. I would say more than daily. I do. And so he gets away. Going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed. And this is what he prayed. That if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. Keller and other commentators point out, if you were making up the story of the gospel, the last thing you would put in there is your hero trying to get out. The last thing he would put in there is your hero saying, I don't really want to do this. Is there another way? But this is what Jesus prayed. It's what he actually prayed, and this is how he prayed it. Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Now the cup. What does that mean? He says, remove this cup from me. See, all throughout the Old Testament, there are these uh, pictures of God's wrath. In fact, these pictures of God's wrath throughout the Old Testament are sometimes why modern thinkers don't like God. They look back and they say, well, how can he be a God of love? I mean, look at the Old Testament. His wrath fell through the flood. His wrath fell on Sodom and Gomorrah. His uh, wrath fell through the plagues. His wrath fell through sending, conquering uh, military in and just obliterating things. I mean, his wrath fell. How can he be a God of love if there's that much wrath in the Old Testament? Now, the first part of my argument here probably won't help. The wrath that we see in the Old Testament is just a foreshadow, a picture, a snapshot of the actual wrath. The flood, the plagues, the conquests, Sodom and Gomorrah. It was just a small picture of God's wrath. If I had a Hot Wheel of a F-350 and I showed it to you, and I'd say, look at the power of this Hot Wheel. And then I pulled in out through there an actual F-350. That's a truck, if you don't know. 
And I said, this is just a snapshot of this. That's what I mean. It's just a, a little metaphor for you. A picture. All of that wrath. And what was that wrath for? And here's the argument. How can a God of love pour out wrath? And the counter argument is this. How can a God of love not? How can a God of love look at that which he loves and see something attacking it? Seeing something destroying that which he loves and not provide justice for it? Here's the issue. Here's the issue. Particularly for modern thinkers. This is 101 of Christianity. The problem is this. We think that we are innocent in the picture of God's wrath. But here's the problem. The wrath of God has to be poured out exactly because of me. I am the problem. There is sin in me. I have rejected and rebelled against God, as has every human. There is a sin problem within humanity, and it builds and it builds and it builds and it builds. Every human is the issue, is the problem, is sin, or has rejected and rebelled against God. And because God loves humanity, he has to deal with that problem. He has to respond to that which is destroying what he loves. So the wrath of God is a God of love dealing with the problem that is destroying what he loves. So what does this mean in the garden? Here's what it means. It means... That for all of eternity, Jesus had looked to his heavenly father. And every time he did, like in his baptism or on the mountain, every time he looked to his father, he saw love and grace and mercy. They were in perfect relationship for all of time. And every time Jesus had been in relationship with his heavenly father, all he could see was love and grace and mercy. But he sees something in the garden that another translation would say, it brought great horror upon him. It was a, such a shocking, uh, scary picture of what he saw in that moment that it brought him to his knees and it made him sweat blood. What could do that? When I was in high school, uh, a group of friends and I were, uh, we were over to a friend's house and we we're just kind of walking. And uh, we, he lived in a neighborhood near another high school. And so we were walking near that high school. And as we turned the corner, there were these two guys and they were carrying a bag. And um, one of them pulled out uh, what looked like to me a real gun and pointed it at us. And it was one of those moments where you're like, now I found out later it was a paintball gun. Uh, but I didn't know enough in that moment to be able to discern what was different. And it shook me. Now, I've also, um, not a lot, but I've shot uh, some other guns or gone to the range with people who do. And, uh, you know, the number one rule of a gun, right? You never point it at somebody. And that's like, never do that. Sorry, I think it's my shirt. And, and, but when you're there, when you're at the range, if, if the gun at any point ever kind of gets pointed towards you, even though it is completely uh, incapable of firing, even though you know it's not loaded, it's like, whoa, whoa, don't do that. No, don't point that at me. It's terrifying. In the garden, Jesus looks to his heavenly Father, and after all of eternity, up until that point, he looks at him, and instead of seeing love, grace, and mercy, he sees the barrel of God's wrath. All of it. Now, I'm taking some liberty here. And it's theologically accurate, though not completely presented this way in Scripture. The, the, the God's wrath is pointed out 
And this is how I see it. Theologically, this is accurate. The wrath is pointed. And you know where it's pointed? Peter, James, and John, and the rest of the disciples, and all of humanity. And you know what Jesus does in that moment? He goes, no, no, no. He says, point it at me. Point it at me. So Jesus is looking at the perfect, holy Father, and all of the wrath of humanity is now pointed right at him. And you know what his response is? He falls to the ground. He is overcome with horror. He is stricken. He is full of sorrow. And all he can do is pray. And this is what he prays. Abba, Father, he is crying out like a child to their dad. All things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. In other words, point your wrath elsewhere. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Then he leaves after this unbelievable moment. And he came and he found them sleeping. He looks at his friends. They're sleeping. And he said to Peter, notice the transition here, by the way. And he came and he found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon. When Jesus refers to Simon, he's referring to an unredeemed, unregenerate man. When he refers to Peter, he's referring to what Peter is going to be. And so he's looking at him and he calls him Simon. He says, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Could you not fight with me for one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter temptation. Jesus is actually warning him right here. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. I actually think that's a picture of uh, each and every one of us at some point and of the church, that we would not be asleep, that we would be awake to what God is doing, and that prayer (laughs) is the way to be awake, and prayer is the way uh, that we get prepared for what is to come. It says, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. What's he talking about? He's talking about what's about to happen. Peter's denial that's about to occur. He's saying, get ready. Now, verse 39 is interesting. It says, and again he went away and prayed. Mark, in this gospel, presents it like there's three different of these. uh, Jesus prays and he comes back. Jesus prays and he comes back. Jesus prays and he comes back. In the gospel of Luke, Luke kind of uh, bundles it all up into one experience. He just writes it a little bit differently. In the gospel of Matthew, he presents it as uh, three back and forths as well. And then we read in the Hebrew scripture that I read uh, before I got started, some more information about this moment. I don't have time to get into all of it. You can read it on your own. To back up what I'm saying, you can do that. That's a good thing to do. But here's something that's interesting. Between the first prayer and the second prayer, when we read through the Gospel of Matthew and connect it back to the Hebrews passage, something changes. Now I know... That it says he went away and he prayed, saying the same words. Which would make you think, if you're just reading the Mark passage, that he prayed the exact same prayer that he had just prayed. But it is possible that when Mark says he prayed the same words, that what he meant was this. Yet not what I will, but what you will. That Jesus ended every prayer with those exact same words. So what did he pray the second time and the third time? He had already prayed, take it from me. And he got an answer. And you know what it was? No. No. 
There is no other way. There is no other way to deal with this problem. You have to take on my wrath. So the second time, the third time he goes to pray, Jesus' prayer has changed. This time what he's praying is this. Strengthen me to endure this sorrow. Give me the ability. It says he learned obedience, the scripture said. Through his sorrow, Jesus learns how to be obedient with the wrath of God facing him. This is what I would call the strength of sorrow. That in the midst of this moment, his prayer transitions into this, not change my circumstance, but change me. Change me. Give me the strength to endure this sorrow because of my love for your people, for me, for you. Now he goes and he prays again. And after he prays again, he comes back and he says, this is verse 41, are you still sleeping and taking your rest? He's talking to the, uh, Peter, James, and John again. Then look at this guy who's speaking. He says, it is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Do you see the, even in the way that it is written, do you see the shift that has happened in Jesus? The guy who came in to the moment of greatest sorrow and who sees the wrath of God pointed out, uh, aimed at him, it drives him to his knees. He, he says, in essence, point it all at me to save them and to protect them. The answer, again, to his first request is no. So he goes back in prayer again, and he goes back in prayer again. The Hebrews tells us, or the Hebrews passage, that in that moment he learns obedience and he learns strength to endure it. And then at the end, he says, rise. He goes in, he falls to his knees, he keeps praying, and now he says, rise. In other words, I will now go face this. Where did that strength come from? Those moments of prayer. Those moments of prayer with the Father. It taught him obedience in the midst of any circumstance. In fact, I think what in part this passage is teaching us is this. If Jesus can learn in his human nature, if he can learn obedience to face the experience of the wrath of God through prayer, and that same Christ the Spirit is in you, then you and I have the ability in Christ through prayer to have the strength to remain obedient regardless of the situation we face. And I am not making light of your circumstance or situation. I'm not, because some of you have been driven to your knees, just like Christ was. Some of you have cried out as Christ has cried out. What does this passage teach you? That in that moment you have a friend in Christ who understands and in that moment, you have an ability to be victorious and to remain obedient as Christ was. You know, there's something else, too. We're taught elsewhere that in joy, Christ went to the cross. In Christ, when Jesus is king, you and I 
have an ability to face the circumstances of life in such a way that makes no sense to the outside world. Jesus here, he doesn't downplay sorrow. He, he doesn't detach from it. He doesn't just get distracted. He doesn't say, uh, you know, it's going to be okay because I'll be in heaven someday. No, he, he, he weeps. He sweats blood. He knows sorrow. And you and I can know it too. We can live, we, we can experience it. We don't have to have trite answers to our sorrow. Christ did not. But in sorrow, through prayer, a strength can emerge that produces obedience and even joy. And I can tell you, this is, <laughs> this is one of those signs that you can begin to know. Man, I have been changed by him. When you can begin to walk through those circumstances and situations, and you can begin to see a perspective that is different, when you can begin to pray a prayer of obedience, regardless if the circumstance changes, that's a strength. That's a strength of sorrow. Now, if you think, I'm too weak for that, I can't do that. I don't know if I can. And I just, I want to remind you, and I want to tell you in those moments to look back at this story. To look back at Jesus sliding in the way of the wrath and saying, no, 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 put it on me. Put it on me, put it on me, not them. I want you to see someone who loves you that much. And next week we'll talk about how he then went to the cross and he conquered it and he was victorious over it so that you too, you too could be obedient like this. And where does that leave us? Two things. First, it should, it should make us as sorrowful over sin as Christ was. Now, we're not without hope. I'm not saying that. We're not um, a bunch of Eeyores walking around. But it should make us view sin and be sorrowful over it. To see the, the magnitude of it. And it's not that we should live in that, but we shouldn't dismiss it either. What else should it do? It should bring us to a place of desiring obedience as Christ was. And so as I let you leave this morning here in a few moments, can I just ask you a question? Are you being obedient to Christ? Are you being obedient? Are you allowing yourself to be changed? Those behaviors, those thought patterns. Are you seeing what Christ did in the garden and how he became obedient through prayer and sorrow and saying, I too, I want that. I want that. And then lastly, do you have this type of prayer life? Do you? Do you have the type of prayer life that in the midst of the sorrow, instead of running to distraction or detachment, you run into the Father? And I'm not saying you shouldn't pray for it to be changed. You can. But can you get to the place where regardless if it is, you'll be obedient? Do you have that kind of prayer life? If not, just begin it now. Just begin it now. Run to your father. 